We're going to talk a little bit in this segment about the role of immunotherapy, Dr. Plimak, in bladder cancer. Traditionally, over the last 25 years, we've had fairly few advances in the management of metastatic advanced bladder cancer. And in the last few years, there's been a sudden surge of these newer, very exciting immunotherapy treatments for bladder cancer on a background of a fairly bleak situation historically. Tell us where we were 25 years ago and how things have changed today. Sure, so prior to 2016, in the setting of metastatic bladder cancer, again, this is cancer that's spread where we can't cure it, but the goal is to control it. Prior to 2016, the last FDA approval for a new drug for bladder cancer was in the 1970s. So that's a really long time without new approved treatments. Now we did try other chemotherapy here and there based on some small trials that we've used along the way. But really, when I began practicing and treating metastatic bladder cancer, I can count on you know three fingers <laughs> the options that made sense for my patients. And the other piece of it is they were all chemotherapy. So they were all treatments that all had side effects to some degree and all had chronic side effects. Which is really quite amazing, is it? When you think about other cancers where we've heard about such amazing developments year right. on year for the last 20 years. Right. And yet bladder cancer was really sort of stuck back in the old days. Bladder cancer was stuck. I think there was not as much interest in bladder cancer. It wasn't appreciated as the common disease that it is. Um, I think some of the trials that, that were done initially were poorly designed and so didn't work and that led to more, more pessimism. And so when I entered the field, there was sort of this feeling that, uh, you know, bladder cancer is such a hard disease to treat. And I think a lot of medical oncologists of our generation took up that as a challenge, right? Well, this is an area that really needs help. Let's, let's dig in, let's investigate in that. And fortunately, our partners in the basic science side and the pharmaceutical side have also come to recognize this disease as one that needs investigation and needs to be treated. So starting in 2014, 2015, these immunotherapy trials for bladder cancer came on board and we signed up for those right away. Some of the first patients treated with the drug you're on now were treated at Fox Chase as part of a very early trial looking at one of the first checkpoint inhibitors and based on the results that were seen, we were extremely impressed. While the drug didn't work for everybody, what we were seeing was when it did work, it worked incredibly well without all the chronic side effects that we saw. Now, we're hearing so much about immunotherapy in many, many different cancers, and some of these immunotherapy agents that we're using in bladder cancer have also been used on other, other types cancers, of cancers. Absolutely. Is that because we're now focusing on addressing the immune system to fight cancer as opposed to these chemotherapy agents that are focusing on the specific type of cancer. Is that the difference, do you think, that so, why these are working? I think it's actually less complex than that. I think when a drug works in one cancer, it's natural and sort of part of the process to try it and see what other cancers it works in. For chemotherapy, it generally wasn't very successful. You would try one chemo in one and it didn't work for others. Same with targeted therapy. For instance, the targeted therapies we use for kidney cancer were tested in bladder cancer and other cancers, but they didn't work. What's different about the checkpoint inhibitors is that the success in all the different tumor types in which they've been tried has been really unprecedented. To have an agent that works so well, or so consistently, I should say, across lung cancer, melanoma, head and neck cancer, bladder cancer, kidney cancer, and the list is growing by the minute, um, I think that really speaks, again, to the mechanism of action of these drugs, helping the immune system recognize cancer, whatever type it is, and then attack it. Now, before we bring Michael on to talk about what it's like to be the guinea pig taking these <laughs> medications and asking right. Jean about the potential side effects, do you see a role of these immunotherapies to come on board after standard chemotherapies have been used and potentially failed, or do you actually see a role of them replacing the chemotherapy agents that we use today. Where are we right now? I think in the setting of metastatic disease, it's a stepwise process. We try one thing, we try to you know hope it works for as long as possible, and then we want to be ready with the next thing. So I don't see anything replacing anything else. They're just adding tools to our toolbox, right, that we can use to treat it. When we're talking about earlier stages of disease, we're definitely investigating using checkpoint inhibitors instead of, for instance, the chemotherapy you've had, mm -hmm. because wouldn't it be great if we could also cure more people with immunotherapy, but with a 
hopefully lower side effect burden. So that's the subject of active clinical trials currently. I mean, surely it makes sense if these drugs are working so well in patients who have more advanced disease, doesn't it make sense? Isn't the logic that if we bring them forward in the treatment regime and use them earlier in the disease, maybe even before we can detect disease on scans and treat patients with microscopic disease that we may not actually be able to see, but we often know exactly. is there. Is that the hope? Right, so that's what we're investigating now in active clinical trials. We hope that's the case. That always has to be balanced with, you don't want to over-treat people either. These drugs are not without problems and they have caused problems for some of our other patients, unfortunately. So you're always balancing over-treatment versus you know, just getting the more, more effective treatment in earlier. And these immunotherapy drugs, you've already mentioned that the time that they've been around is relatively short mm -hmm. and yet already some of these have been FDA approved and have been using in clinical oh, yeah. practice very widely today, yes? Very widely, and part of that is the approval process has accelerated, and that's based on advocacy on the part of patients for diseases like CML, one of the leukemias. A great drug was invented for that disease, but it was very slow to get approved because of the processes in place. Those processes and hats off to the FDA for really coming up with these accelerated approval pathways. And all of the five checkpoint inhibitors approved for bladder cancer were all, um, most all except for one, initially approved as part of this accelerated pathway. And that made us able to bring them to patients sooner than we otherwise would be able to. Now we know that just because a drug is FDA approved doesn't mean that it's necessarily affordable or even mm -hmm. accessible for the patients. Mm -hmm. Talk about the accessibility issues overall for patients who are medically eligible for these drugs. How easy is it to get the patient on these drugs in terms of the accessibility and also are these covered by insurance for patients? Right, so in the United States, FDA approval leads to insurance coverage. We've rare, rarely seen an exception to that. So that's pretty straightforward for our patients. In Europe, it's a different story. Um, access in, in Europe and in other countries outside of the United States and Europe has been more challenging. But in general, I think because these agents work for a variety of cancers, even medical oncologists in the community are familiar with them and know how to use them. And so there's less of a barrier to using them for our patients with bladder cancer.